Welcome everybody back here to the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke and I'm the director of the Siegel Center. It's great to see you all here, also such great numbers. As you all know, we are restarting our programs and slowly trying to get back um, into uh, live presenting and presenting what we think are meaningful events, events that have an impact and events that deal with the main uh, mission of our center to bridge academia and professional theater, also international and American theater, but also to plant the foot of academia, I think, in the research um, for the theater that we have in town and the performing arts. And tonight, I think, is one of the um, evenings um, which uh, we are very proud to, to uh, present you tonight. Uh, we have Jim Wilson with us and Jordan. <laughs> Yes, still got, yes, and um, and uh, we are having a book celebration. We, as you know, we uh, publish many books and journals here um, at the uh, Graduate Center and at the Siegel Center. We we'll get together with Marvin Carlson, who's also the director of publishing. We are the largest publisher of uh, Arab plays and translation in the world, by the way. And next to many other things, we published six books in the last uh, eight months. A uh, little Corona backlog. Next to many other things, we did as the Prelude Festival. But um, tonight, uh, we're going to see a conversation with Jim and Jordan about a book that topic is of significance, always is, but perhaps even now a little bit more in the big picture is about the representation of teachers on the stage and in the performing arts uh, in the American stage. And I think it's a big topic. Uh, it touches on many, many uh, issues on, uh, on gender, on race, on ideology, and how do you deal with the uh, transfer of information? How do we transfer information to a next generation? That's what teachers do. That's what the Graduate Center does. That's what our great program does. And um, so I would like to welcome both of you guys to come in here. And uh, uh, Jim worked for uh, many, many, how many years did you work on the book? Well, I'm just telling somebody um, about 10, uh, but it wasn't 10 straight years. I started it on a sabbatical, it lived on my desktop. I got tired of looking mm -hmm. at it on my desktop and about a year and a half or so ago, I went back to it. Yeah, it's like great novels, um, uh, you know, take they take their time, you go back and forth, you wait. And um, and we have uh, the highest respect for everybody who pre presents a book, who finishes a book. I think so much people go bananas about a touchstone, but write a PhD, write a book and defend it and present it. This is a big achievement. And um, so, um, Jim, welcome uh, at the Siegel Center. Thank you for uh, uh, joining us tonight. And we all would like to know more about failure, fascism and teachers in American theater. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank Frank. A couple of weeks ago, I saw him in the hallway and he just said, how's your book coming? I said, oh, publication is imminent. And in typical Frank, generous and um, celebratory style said, well, we need to do something. So here we are. So thank you. And I also want to thank... And I also want to thank my dear friend and uh, GC alum, um, Jordan Schultkraut, who hadn't even read the book when I asked him if he would participate in this, and he unhesitatingly said yes. So thank you, Jordan. Uh, and finally, I want to thank all of you here tonight. It really means a lot to me. Uh, my partner, Kevin Lustick, who uh, offered constant encouragement throughout and is the paragon of patience. Um, and then one of my all-time favorite artists, Tug Rice, designed the cover. And so, and in this case, I beg of you, judge this book by its cover. So, um, and I'm also thrilled to see so many of my dear friends who've come from far and near to be here tonight. And I also just want to uh, call attention to the fact that several of my former and current students from LaGuardia, the Graduate Center and Muhlenberg are here tonight. So uh, I appreciate that. A uh, number of colleagues from uh, LaGuardia and the Graduate Center are here. And some of those colleagues are actually former students so, and I also just want to call attention to my former professor and uh, my academic role model, Marvin Carlson. So I'm so glad to take it And 
looking at all of you here this evening, all I can think is, I didn't order enough food. <laughs> so, uh, but there will be a reception following. Um, so what I would like to do is, since I do not expect anyone to buy this book, uh, at the retail price, I will not be buying this book. Uh, so what I thought I would do is just give you a brief tour before uh, Jordan and I sit down to uh, have a conversation about the uh, book and um, the work that's in it. Uh, and I do want to also say, uh, I did donate a book to the DTSA, the Doctoral, Student, uh, Doctoral Theater Student Association, and they are um, conducting a raffle. So I urge you to um, take a chance. Uh, but it's for a very good cause. It's for um, uh, student travel and research endeavors. So even if you don't want the book uh, and you can contribute to the DTSA, that would be great. Um, all right, so let me tell you a little bit about this undertaking. undertaking. I took on this project uh, because of my deep love for both teaching and theater. Although I wear many professional hats as a program administrator, as a theater historian, as a reviewer, I am, in the words of Miss Jean Brody, a teacher first, last, and always. Uh, I am certainly not in my prime, and except for the fascism, um, <laughs> uh, Jean Brody and I are similar in that I have also dedicated my life to this profession. Uh, I am especially fascinated with the ambivalent attitudes toward, I have to remember to point that way, uh, my ambivalent attitude towards educators at all levels. On one hand, they are revered and, oh, uh, they are revered and celebrated uh, working as part of the most noble profession in um, the class I just came from. As a matter of fact, we were talking about uh, some of the uh, impacts that teachers have had on our lives. Uh, but on this, on the other hand, on the other hand, <laughs> there it is. Um, see, you don't name a book failure and expect to uh, <laughs> be successful. Um, I must, um, I, find that teachers also bear the brunt of all of the problems of society. They are the ones who are blamed for all of the social ills. Uh, they are alternately accused of being lazy, sinister, and um, recently as pernicious groomers. Uh, so one of the things that I notice is that this ambivalence is nowhere as present as it is in the theater. Uh, so what I would like to do is just uh, give a brief snapshot of the five uh, content chapters that follow. Uh, and the first one, Frank, the clicker's not working. There it is, okay. Uh, the first chapter looks at the representations of women's teachers. And up through the early 20th century, uh, most women teachers were barred from being married. Uh, and concurrently, philo uh, philosophers and sexologists pointed to spinsters as mannish, sexually non-conforming, and deviant in their apparent refusal to engage in normal heterosexual coupling. And this monstrous and sadistic school marm, for example, was a familiar character in vaudeville and burlesque sketches through the 1920s. And um, as a writer in The Free Woman, a feminist publication wrote in 1911, I write of the high priestess of society, not of the mother of sons, but of her barren sister, the withered tree, the acidulous vestal under whose pale shadow we chill and whiten of the spinster, I write. Um, so for many, uh, teaching was a profession that you did until you were hopefully able to get out of the profession and marry as a uh, writer in the New York Times wrote, those who can marry, those who cannot continue to teach. Um, so on um, the other hand, the spinster 
teacher is occasionally pitiable in her solitary professional existence and heroic in her single-minded devotion to her young charges, as in Harry James Smith's uh, The Little Teacher and Emmeline Williams' um, The Corn is Green. And there's a photo of Miss Moffat, I think probably my all-time favorite teacher. Uh, other examples in this chapter include Annie Sullivan in The Miracle Worker and Miss Dove in um, Good Morning, Miss Dove. Another um, interesting character that I look at is Rosemary Sidney from Picnic, if you're familiar with her. She's the example of she just wants to get married so she can get out of teaching. She claims at first that um, it offers her independence, but as soon as the chance comes up, uh, she takes it. Sorry. Uh, in the second half of the 20th century, more and more women were going into the university, still far outnumbered by men. And um, current statistics show that women have a much harder time with tenure and getting promoted. Uh, and in plays such as the Heidi Chronicles, Wit, Office Hour, and Confederates, uh, the women teachers are referred to often explicitly as superwomen. And in the case of Heidi in the Heidi Chronicles, uh, when a television reporter asks her about her being a superwoman, uh, she says, no, you have to keep too many lists to be a superwoman. What's also notable about these plays is almost all of, except for one that I think, uh, they're single, uh, almost to suggest that the woman cannot have it all as a uh, professor. And Sandra in Confederates also articulates the um, particular uh, hardships uh, uh, that African-American women face in um, the university. She says, it is very, very hard to be a woman in academia, a black woman, even harder. So in the second chapter, um, I look at uh, in the, uh, interwar years. And at that time, more and more students were going into schools and actually staying in schools uh, more so than before. And as the depression wore on and another world war loomed, the promise and future of the youth seemed especially important. As a result, the physical and psychological fitness of teachers as role models for their students became a source of scrutiny and panic. And um, in 1929, the Board of Education stated, a teacher has an obligation to look after his own health, not only to increase his efficiency, to, but, but to set an example of an ideal of healthy adulthood. And there are many stories um, at this time in which teachers were fired, for instance, for being too heavy. Uh, one particularly cruel example uh, was a um, woman was fired because she was um, considered a fire hazard. And to prove it, uh, the Board of Education conducted a fire drill to show that um, she was unfit and couldn't um, move out of the building uh, fast enough. Uh, the other major issue was homosexuality. And that was uh, a, a huge concern. Uh, and this played itself out in a lot of the plays of the period. And as Willard Waller, wrote, Sorry. Uh, nothing seems more certain than that homosexuality is contagious. And um, in uh, several of the plays uh, of the interwar period, this is evident. So I look at a uh, trio, which is uh, explores the relationship of a uh, professor and a student. And luckily, or I shouldn't say, but for that student, the student is saved by a cisgender uh, white male who's anti-intellectual uh, and takes her out of the clutches of this vampiric uh, lesbian professor. Uh, the Rats of Norway uh, is a play that uh, has all kinds of couplings. An interesting thing about The Rats of Norway, it also has a sissy character. And um, unlike almost all of the plays that deal with homosexuality, that character is not destroyed in the end, which I find kind of interesting. And then of course, there's the children's hour. Um, and uh, to go back to this idea of homosexuality as contagious, an interesting side note is that the children's hour is based on an actual school from 1810 Scotland. And there was a, um, 
homosexual panic uh, and all of the students were removed from that school. But uh, in an interesting footnote, uh, all but one of those students could not be put into another school because they were uh, concerned that the students having been exposed to homosexuality would cause another outbreak in a school, another school. Um, okay, so the next chapter uh, should say uh, this was a sign that I saw in the Graduate Center. Uh, those of you who are at the Graduate Center may have seen similar signs. I noticed there's one um, today about how um, teachers and students are being targeted for their outspoken views on what's happening in Israel and Gaza. And it sent chills down my spine because I thought, oh, here we go again. Uh, because the chapter I focus on is um, the, um, um, sorry, the, the fact that in the 1940s and 1950s, colleges, schools, and universities were presumed hotbeds of communist activity, and thousands of predominantly male school teachers and professors were interrogated for their political beliefs, and most of those investigated were forced to leave the profession. Uh, so you'll see lots of headlines like um, this about um, communist activities. And uh, oaths of loyalty, which were um, uh, becoming more and more prevalent in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, Hollywood films, as it has been well documented, uh, shied away from critiquing the Red Scare, but um, the theater was not so shy. So there were a number of plays that uh, focused on some of these issues, including the light, um, very silly, but I, I think it's probably still revivable, uh, The Male Animal by James Thurber and Elliot Nugent, uh, the melodrama uh, decision by Edward Chodorov, and uh, The Egghead um, by Molly Kazan, uh, Elia's wife. Um, moving on, the next chapter looks at um, the debates around progressive education. And by the 1960s, progressive education had really become a hot topic, that uh, there was a demand for back to the basics um, approaches to teaching. And some of the main figures in uh, progressive education, such as uh, John Dewey, uh, who wrote School and Society, Democracy and Education, Experience Education, uh, Experience and Education. It said that the uh, schools should be a rehearsal for democracy. It should be a place to um, uh, train uh, people for democratic citizenship. Uh, A.S. Neal, uh, some say, took Dewey's ideas way too far. A.S. Neal uh, created a school called Summerhill, and this was an um, experiment that I think actually still goes on. In Summerhill, the students are the ones creating the rules. Uh, the students um, decide what they will learn, when they will learn. Uh, somebody uh, was observing and said he couldn't believe he walked by a classroom and the teacher had her feet up on the desk and the children were chewing bubble gum. Uh, and that was the outrage. Uh, and then finally, uh, looking at um, Paula Freire, whose um, uh, major uh, uh, contribution to education is the pedag pedagogy of the oppressed. And my book actually riffs on that title, minus the pedagogy of the oppressors. And Paula Freire had an idea that um, traditional education treats students as empty vessels in which knowledge is poured into them. Uh, the three plays in this chapter, um, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, Miss Margarita's Way, and Sister Mary Ignatius explains it all for you, um, test and thwart some of those principles of progressive education. Uh, they can also be 
uh, read as allegories for um, uh, dictator uh, controlled societies. And in particular, if you're familiar with Miss Margarita's way, we are, as the audience members, her classroom and she bullies us. She calls us uh, faggots and morons. And she says that if we uh, behave, she'll show us parts of her body. Um, but, um, and then of course, Sister Mary Ignatius is pretty fierce nun. Uh, in the course of the play, she shoots two of the students. <laughs> um, and then the last chapter is um, an exploration of men in uh, drama and theater. And um, Willard Waller uh, described teaching as a failure belt or for a, or a profession uh, that was suited for men who could make who could not make it in business and for women who couldn't get married he writes a further element in the popular prejudice against teachers is that teaching is quite generally regarded as a failure belt there is some justice in this belief a popular epigram of a few years ago had had it that teaching was the refuge of unsaleable men and unmarriageable women uh, and he goes on to say uh, that it has been said that no woman and no Negro is ever fully admitted to the white man's world. Possibly we should add men teachers to the list of the excluded. Um, so this chapter explores the ingrained idea that men who teach are failed men uh, as members of a woman dominated profession of a woman dominated profession, uh, recipients of comparatively modest salaries and intellectuals in an anti-intellectual, hyper-masculinized society, they supposedly forfeit their masculinity. Um, many of the teachers that are portrayed, um, such as um, uh, the Browning version, Butley, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, um, uh, A Child's Play, Quartermain's Terms, um, all show uh, men as unhappy, dissolute, and very often drunk. Um, and it shows uh, the transgressive failure, emasculation, and fatuousness of the male teacher. And then finally, so we can get to the good part of the conversation with Jordan, um, I just want to conclude by saying that theater and performance, like gifted teachers, have the power to reveal to us who we are, what we value, and how we fit in the world. My hope is that this book and that the chapters taken together will provide deeper insights into fraught educational, political, and social histories to help us better understand the culture wars uh, that we are currently in. Representation matters. Perhaps deconstructing well-worn tropes will encourage educators, artists, and scholars to forge new ones. These are the lessons and legacies we can impart to generations of future teachers. And I'll just conclude uh, with the words of Hector from the History Boys, who says, pass the parcel. That's sometimes all you can do. Take it, feel it, and pass it on. Not for me, not for you, but for someone somewhere one day. Pass it on, boys. That's the game I wanted you to learn. Pass it on. Thank you. So um, thank you, Jim. This was a, a great overview and very beautiful to, to listen to the watch. So uh, I hand it over to both of you. Um, I think it should be on. Can you test? Hello, hello. Yes. Jordan? I believe we're okay. Yeah. We're ready to go. So um, maybe again to Jim first, and then take over. Why, why of all the themes to choose from, why did you choose this one? In terms of teachers and theater? Um, well, first of all, as I said, because I love teachers, I come from uh, a long line of teachers, and um, I'm also fascinated by the way they are per they're presented on stage. And whenever having well, I should say having been a teacher for now thirty years or so, um, I look at these plays and I say, 
that's not my experience. That's not um, what it actually is to be a teacher, but it seems like that is the accepted view of teachers. So, and I'm also very interested in the history of education and um, how these plays fit into that history of education. I mean, if I can speak, I'll say, sorry, hold on just one second. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, Jim, when I had the pleasure of reading your book over this past week, um, which I just enjoyed thoroughly, one of the insights that struck me is one of the things that you point out that almost everyone in our society will at some point have a connection to a teacher. We all experience teachers, but yet often as students, we only experience them within the rarely, you know, the relatively narrow confines of the classroom. So these plays, and perhaps our interest in these plays, I think you're pointing out, is to get almost a behind the scenes look at what the lives of these important people in our lives, these influential people in our lives may actually be. Mm -hmm. uh, and the variety of sort of biographies, the variety of different lives lived by these characters um, just really paints a complex portrait of that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's in the previous class, as I mentioned, I just came from class, we we're talking about bell hooks. And um, one of the things that bell hooks says, and I don't know if this quite ties in, one of the reasons why we have this um, misconception of teachers is we don't think of them as uh, people in their bodies. We think about them as minds uh, only. So that uh, there's this assumption that teachers don't work uh, because they're not using their bodies in their classroom. And um, so I think that one of the things that I find interesting about the plays in particular, oftentimes that's the opposite. I mean, um, in many cases, they're almost pure body. I mean, of course, um, theater is performative, but you think about a character like Blanche Dubois, who was a former teacher. Uh, and um, and by the way, it's also interesting. She also has a gay panic and she says that that was what um, caused her to become um, the abuser that she was. I mean, it's an interesting example. Like in the book, you have um, so much in insight into a wide variety of plays, um, which I mean, I think the audience here got some sense of from your presentation, but I almost want to take it further and point out, for example, uh, that you deal with some plays that are very much, you know, in the mainstream, in the canon of American theater, others that may be familiar, you know, but not as well known. And then some that I feel like you've actually rescued from the shadows of history. Uh, one of the most interesting sections to me is actually on the play Trio, because to the best of my knowledge, that's never been published. Is that true? That's true. Yeah. And so I'm curious about like your research into yeah. this, how that process was, if you could talk about that. Well, I spent a lot of time in the archives, uh, and I think rescue might be too strong a word for some of these plays. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, some of these plays are just not very good plays. I mean, they're um, not doable. But in terms of um, the process of just um, reading and play like trio was interesting because there was so much drama on the other side of the play. It had trouble getting to New York. And then um, when it did get a theater, the theater was revoked and it um, closed, but it had nothing to do with the lesbian content as um, they were continually told. Uh, but in terms of um, the pleasures uh, with finding these plays, uh, another one is The Egghead, uh, the Molly Kazan play, which again is not a very good play, but it's um, a really fascinating play in terms of um, how it was reflecting society at that time. Good. And I feel like so often that's you know um, what I appreciated about your insights, that you're understanding these plays, whether they are like you know considered masterpieces like um, you know, Speaker Named Desire, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, or perhaps not so much, but still that you take them seriously in terms of the emblematic nature of what they're reflecting. What do these characters tell? us about society. Mm -hmm. And I feel I was impressed by your own sense of the depth of knowledge about theater history production. So like that you talk about, for example, the different controversies around particular plays like Sister Mary Ignatius is another one, right? Yeah. But then also the larger social context, like so much of the what you presented with us here today even shows this um, interest 
in really a cultural history of education mm -hmm. and what that's been in American society. Are there things that you sort of like discovered in that that surprised you in terms of like how we have thought about education in the past or perhaps now? Um, yes, I mean, one of the things that surprised me was um, particularly what was going on in the 1940s. I mean, I um, knew what was going on in terms of there was a, um, a huge number of plays that dealt with um, uh, gays and lesbian characters. But what surprised me was what was happening in real life in terms of how teachers were being targeted. And uh, for instance, there was another case, the Board of Education went into a school and um, well, they said he said that out of the 30, I think I'll probably get these numbers wrong, but out of the 36,000 New York City teachers, 1,600 were either um, insane or um, psychologically unfit. And he um, conducted a test and he, um, oh, well, first he went into a classroom and he saw that one teacher had her desk uh, with the uh, foot right up to a boy's eye because uh, she claimed that the other children were looking at her and um, she he wanted she wanted to deflect the attention or another teacher uh, was given the pro the uh, math problem if one apple costs five cents how many would 15 cost and um, he wrote that the teacher um, said she couldn't figure it out without scratch paper so she filled up two sides of the paper and then finally I just had to say I'm stumped. Um, so lots of cases like that where um, teachers were um, demonized. Um, and as I said, it became a national obsession. And then when we look at what's happening today, and I'm sure we'll uh, probably have some time, uh, but what's happening in Florida and what's happening in Texas, for instance, that teachers can't be trusted um, to teach material and that um, students uh, cannot be exposed to um, racism and uh, racial histories as well. So I guess the surprises, to go back to your original question, was how little things have changed. Mm -hmm. That these kind of, I don't know, cyclical uh, cultural panics yeah. or culture wars and the way that education and then, of course, teachers are kind of positioned within that, mm -hmm. right? Um, you also though, talk about different philosophies of education and the way that the plays represent that. Um, and so I'm curious, like, are there examples of the teacher characters that you looked at that you feel are emblematic of, shall we say, the best teachers and the worst teachers? Like, what? How do we, how do we know what a good teacher is in this world of the theater? In the theater, that's a. I would say, and one of the things that. Um, I look at it and I look at some uh, psychological theories as well. Uh, somebody like Miss Moffat, I'll just um, talk about Miss Moffat for a moment. Uh, Miss Moffat is um, complete, she gives herself completely over to this one student and she um, makes all kinds of sacrifices. And when the student gets a um, young woman pregnant, um, she doesn't want his chances uh, to be um, to be undermined. So she agrees to raise the child. What I love about Miss Moffat, though, is it really wasn't for the other student. It was for her. She even says, you know, this is what I had envisioned. This is what I dreamt of. And at the end, when somebody brings the baby's adoption papers, uh, she says, what's that? Oh, I forgot all about that. I mean, she forgot all about this um, baby that she's just taken on. Um, so even in the best of teachers, we see that um, the motives aren't always so pure. Right. So the kind of difference in um, pedagogy yeah. between the teacher who inspires mm -hmm. and somehow is almost like self-sacrificing yeah. for the student, but then in other cases where they are little classroom dictators, yeah. right? And it's about enforcing conformity of thought yeah. and of behavior um, and how that tension seems to be recurring mm -hmm. in so much of the work that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I did think of um, a teacher for us to admire, Sarah Rule's uh, play, mm. um, Max, uh, Letters from Max, A Ritual. Uh, and in that play, um, she talks about 
being a student as well as being a teacher. So I think that that might be um, an example of good teaching. Okay, good. Um, I'm curious to know a bit more about your inspiration. You talk about being the child of teachers, mm -hmm. um, but as you were writing this book, did it cause you to reflect on your own practice as a teacher? It did. Um, well, I should say that, and as I mentioned, um, uh, in some ways I identify with Miss Jean Brody as a teacher, first, last, and always. As a child, um, my mother told me that I used to create lesson plants. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, she was uh, impressed with my lesson plans. Uh, but that's the surest way to not be a popular kid. Uh, you know, the neighborhood children would be around and say, oh, look, there's Jimmy Wilson. Is that a lesson plan he's carrying? <laughs> Run. Um, so it, it, as I was uh, writing this, I was also thinking about um, me as a teacher, mm -hmm. about, as I say, my love for teachers. Um, and uh, many of these teachers, um, I felt I knew they could, because I had taught high school for a number of years. I've taught college. So some of them, I felt that I knew them mm -hmm. and sometimes saw myself in them. So, I mean, because I feel like one of the things that you point out about these teachers, whether they're seen as really noble inspirational figures or whether they're seen as horrific monsters who are ruining children, they're charismatic. Yeah. They make good characters. Um, and so this kind of sense of this figure that represents so much about what is either right or wrong in our society, yeah. um, being an object of theatricality. Um, you, you mentioned briefly the fact that in many of these plays, the audience is cast as students mm -hmm. in the theater for this class. Are there other ways that you feel like this is inherently a theatrical um, dynamic? Because, you know, we could obviously talk about teachers and cinema and novels and so forth. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the specific theatricality of what you were looking at and what you found? Yeah. Well, um, I think I kind of alluded to it. Um, one of the things that these teachers often bring to mind is the idea of the cult of the teacher. And so uh, somebody like Miss Jean Brody, who I keep going back to uh, tonight, um, very much exemplifies that. I mean, she's a horrifying, scary person, but especially if you've seen Maggie Smith in the movie, I mean, you um, can't help but um, fall in love with it. Um, this woman, you, um, you know, are angry with the assassin. Um, but um, so I think that's part of it. And I think to your point too, I mean, teaching is, I mean, it goes without saying, is a performative um, profession. Uh, and so many of these characters exemplify uh, those uh, qualities of the um, charismatic teacher, as you mentioned. Good. I mean, as you were talking about Maggie Smith, I was thinking about the fact that so many of these roles, they're really like tour de force roles for some great actors. So like we got to see, you know, like Ethel Barrymore, mm -hmm. things like, you know, Alan Bates and Butley. Um, are there any performances here that you wish you could have seen on stage? Certainly Ethel Barrymore. Okay. Uh, certainly Jessica Tandy in um, um, Streetcar. Um, um I did see uh, Estelle Parsons in Miss Margarita's Way. She did a revival of it in 1990. So I was able to see that performance. Um, I'm trying to think of, oh, I, you know, I've never seen Sister Mary Ignatius on stage. And now I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what. Okay, so we'll have to work on a revival. We'll have to work on a revival. <laughs> Cherry Jones, you available? <laughs> we'll contact her people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious um, to actually know if we should open it up to the audience now. Yeah, we are <clears throat> almost out of time, but uh, uh, one additional question as a German, of course, I have to ask it. If we go look back at the theater as an educational institution, the ideas of Lessing, Goethe, Schiller, um, do you see theater as an educational institution? Is it a, the teacher of society? Um, it can be, the, the plays I'm looking at are not in general. Uh, but I do think that, uh, first of all, well, I should say from my own experience, all I know comes from the theater. 
I mean, anything I know about American history, for instance, is because I saw it in musicals or um, plays. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, so I do think that, yes, uh, it very much serves that purpose. Yeah, maybe you hand it over. I just want to point out, we did an adaptation of the Children's Hour. We, I requested court material at the time and um, uh, gay marriage but was uh, finally um, um, uh, allowed officially in the United States. And, um, and there was a discussion afterwards in the play, and we liked it so much that actually Jim, in the play, which we printed, is a character on stage as a teacher so is jordan mm -hmm. so is jordan so um so you're part of, of that legacy but let's now go um uh, to the audience and um i will come and uh, would like to ask you to maybe shortly introduce yourself and also speak into the mic since the evening is recorded on howl round and we also would like to welcome all our guests on that national platform that so greatly supports um, work of the seals and other many others i do prefer i stand no that <laughs> Hi, I'm Eve. Um, I was lucky enough to read a bit of your book, and it's really wonderful. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of elucidate what you think the role theater has in national conversations of history and politics, et cetera. You sort of touched on that, but what do you think is the role? Um, I don't know if it has a defined role. I think that it assumes uh, that um, it takes on a role. Um, I do think that this is a place for us. The theater is a place to test ideas and to um, um, show um, experiences that people don't get to experience. So in terms of entering the political discourse, I think it has a very important purpose in that regard. Hi, I'm Philip. Oh, that's loud. Um, while you were speaking, Jim, I was thinking of a play I had seen years and years ago off Broadway, and I'm wondering if you touch on it in your book. It was called The Primary English Class with Diane Keaton. I, Are you drawing a blank? I'm drawing a blank. Diane Keaton. Yes, it was at uh, whatever that theater was on McDougal Street. Does anyone remember that? Well, it was with Diane Kidd. All right. Okay. Whatever. No, I don't know that play. Okay. You stumped me. Hi, my name is Mitch. Um, I, my sister was, was a teacher for 30 years, and she retired when she could because she said the the role of parents had changed so much over that 30 years. And I know that is touched on in some plays, like in the children's hour, there's that horrible mother. Um do you find, because I, I didn't realize you had also uh, taught high school, has that, does that affect college professors as well, the role of parents of the students, or is, is that, does that sort of stop when, when you're? My students, generally not, um, or particularly the CUNY students I teach, for instance, at LaGuardia, um, many of them are first generation college students. Um, so parents, that the problem is the parents are not involved enough because um, they don't know how to. Uh, I taught my first, uh, well, actually my second high school teaching position was at a um, very suburban, very good school. Um, and I used to say that the students weren't the problem, the parents were the problem, because if the student got an A minus, the parent would be calling you, how am I, how's my student going to get into um, Yale or Harvard with an A minus? So uh, I encountered that as a high school teacher. I'm Kevin. Uh, when you were doing your research, do you find any teachers who didn't fit neatly into one, into one category? Um, yes, a lot. <laughs> uh, there were um, actually, and is Asya here? I don't think. Asya was my uh, graduate student assistant last year, and uh, Asya helped me put together a an appendix at the end, and there are about 300 plays uh, with teachers in them. Uh, some of the teachers um, weren't quite honestly, very interesting, so I didn't pursue those. And some, um, uh, uh, just, I, I didn't know how to actually talk about them. Or they were repetitive of other teachers. 
Hi, this is Casey. Um, I have a sort of two questions. Sure. The first, um, I don't know if you touch on this in the book, but several of the performances you've mentioned tonight have become movies and been sort of frozen. I'm thinking of, you know, Children's Hour, um, Virginia Woolf, things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you find that that portrayal either changes or becomes more fixed, like if there are differences there. And then secondly, I'm wondering about teachers in musical theater. I'm thinking about Mrs. Anna, but I'm wondering what you found there. Okay. Um, well, I think as Jordan had mentioned, I mean, part of the pleasure of seeing a lot of these plays about teachers on stage is um, they're live and teachers in real life uh, are, as I've already mentioned, bodies and uh, so, even though they may not explicitly break the fourth wall, there is that particular experience. Uh, I never saw Vanessa Redgrave or Zoe Caldwell, but I've already mentioned um, Maggie Smith. I cannot imagine anybody doing that part better than Maggie Smith. Um, in terms of musicals, um, one of the ones actually you had mentioned, uh, King and I, but I was thinking about Matilda. Matilda is a really interesting uh, show. I know it's based on Roald Dahl's novel, but um, that has a couple of um, uh, very familiar um, versions of the teacher. Mrs. Trunchbull or Miss Trunchbull uh, is the typical spinster um, um, mannish um, character and then you have miss honey who is the um very self-sacrificing um also unmarried single woman but very motherly i'll just mention this i mean yeah. the fact that you do touch on musical theater in the book but also some things that we didn't get to so far is like you actually take us back even to like aristophanes yes. and to shakespeare and widen the scope even further in terms of like the way that these archetypes are functioning uh, in a variety of different genres and a variety of different eras. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Professor Wilson. My name is Brittany Vickers, and I was fortunate enough to come from your class today where we were speaking about this and we had a nice warm up. <laughs> um, <laughs> it really was. Um, and I have two questions for you. The first is, we were speaking about the relationship between teachers and students. And I'm curious how that relationship has changed over the course of your 30 years of teaching. And that might be a difficult question, mm -hmm. but have you seen a change? And if so, what is that? Um, very interesting question. Um, again, I, because I'm uh, now primarily, right now primarily working with graduate students. It's a um, very different relationship with um, students. One of the things that kind of saddens me about uh, where teaching has gone, um, teachers are terrified of touching a student, for instance. And I remember that um, when I was in school, um, sometimes teachers would hug the students. And um, now, from what I understand, um, that's not something one does. So I think there's um, a fear, and I could be overstating it, but I think there's more of a fear of the student than there had been for a number of different reasons in terms of the school shootings or accusations, mm -hmm. et cetera. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. I agree. Um, the answer, I agree. Um, question, <laughs> question for the world. Um, now I'm just having a lot of memories as you speak. Um, but I'm, I'm the last thing I'm going to ask you, I, I was thinking about teachers a great deal today that have um, touched me on an emotional level. And I'm curious if you have a lesson that stayed with you from a teacher that you've had. And if so, what is it? Well, um, I would say probably the teacher who had the greatest effect on me was Mrs. Albanese in uh, my third in third grade. Uh, and um, I first of all, she was just such a warm uh, woman. I, I just remember her smiling and big laugh. But uh, she also saw me as this kind of kooky kid. I, I, I have to say, I was not a very good student. Um, I was you know, just too scattered. Um, but that year in third grade, she directed a production of The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and cast me as the scarecrow. Uh, and so um, 
so th that was one of those, uh, I would say, life-changing moments because at that point I could see how theater and school could come together. And then of course, uh, theater is why it was something we talked about in class this evening, uh, but theater was my safe space in high school. Hi, Jim. Hello. Um, so I'm very interested in the differences you found between um, depictions of teachers, meaning 12 and K, K through 12, and professors, um, especially because for women, as you kind of mentioned, teaching has always been a professional option. I mean, in American history, like that's your professional option, teacher and nurse, right? Mm -hmm. But women breaking into becoming professors is much more recent. And if you saw any vestiges of that or any differences in terms of gender. I'm sorry, uh, in terms of differences between women school teachers or women professors? Yes, and also male school teachers and male professors in terms of how they're gendered. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I will say that most of the male professors, not all of the male professors, are, as I mentioned, um, not great people. I mean, you think about um, Virginia Woolf, um, the male professors in that play, um, and you think about um, Butley, for instance, uh, they tend to be drunk. They tend to be um, uh, just cruel with their students. Uh, women, you get the sense that they have to uh, work even harder. Uh, and somebody like Vivian Baring in Wit, for instance, um, in order for her to compete with her male um, colleagues, she has to pretty much sublimate any of her humanity and any of her personal life. So that was something that I also noticed that a lot of the women professor characters are pretty much defined by their job. As I said, um, um, almost all single. Heidi does. I know that uh, many feminists were really angry with that play, but um, Heidi wants to try to have it all by having a baby at the end, but um, still not, still without a partner. I mean, it's interesting. It just made the connection between Miss Moffat and Heidi, that both of these plays yes. end with the woman holding a baby. Well, Miss Moffat's not holding her baby. She's forgotten about the okay. baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh, yeah. But yes, they. But it's true. They both uh, end with uh, the baby. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Erica Lynn. Uh, Jim, I'm really struck by how uh, subversive your book actually is compared to how depressing the title is. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit in um, about your uh, process in selecting out of 300 some odd plays in your appendix, uh, the case studies that you ended up focusing on, and then whether you went in with a lens that was intending to be so, uh, uh, well, I called it subversive, but it's also, it's a deeply feminist, right, um, and deeply, um, you know, um, a homophilic um, reading, and also attentive, I saw from some of your examples, to issues of race. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you go in with a lens um, and was that part of your selection principle? And is did that result in failure in fascism? Or um, did was that an unexpected outcome of the choices that you made? Interesting. Um, in terms of the choices, I uh, because of my own uh, background in um, gender and sexuality studies, I went into it. Actually, the first chapter that I wrote uh, was uh, the queer uh, chapter, uh, focusing on those characters. Um, and one of the, I think what actually oftentimes happened was I started looking at one play. So for instance, um, children's hour. And then as I was looking at children's hour, I said, oh, this has a connection to girls in uniform. Uh, so oftentimes um, those connections revealed themselves to me. Uh, the other choice that I often made, as I said, I'm also um, very interested in education history. And one of the books that I had um, read recently is um, Jackie Blount's book about um, uh, women in the profession. And so, uh, oftentimes I would read 
the theory and I was able to um, see how it relates to a particular play. So oftentimes the plays found me through the theories or through the histories. Thank you. Maybe one more question. I was thinking it was over here, yeah. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Tori. I also just came from Professor Wilson's class. Um, something I noticed throughout the time periods is the sexualization of teachers from either like the sexless spinster or the over-sexualized like seducer of mm -hmm. students. Um, so I was curious how this image of the teacher and how we sexualize specifically women teachers, how do you think that ties into some of the fear and panic um, that's going on today, uh, perhaps with queer women teachers or um, being an example, an adult example of some sort of perverse um, sexuality? Really interesting question. And I think you're absolutely right that that is an issue that um, pervades a lot of the plays. Uh, and I think that the plays reflect that um, cultural, both the fetishization of teachers, but also the fear of teachers. And I think that um, one of the things that runs through history is the fact that, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, parents were giving over their children to the teachers. So there was a great deal of fear that with that closeness, um, they could use, uh, they could groom, to use um, an awful term that we have now, <clears throat> um, so I think that closeness is a particular fear. Even I mentioned David Mamet, um, who's a pig. Uh, he had um, said um, last year that um, men uh, teachers um, are drawn to teaching because they're uh, naturally pedophiles. Um, so, and Randy Weingarten um, really gave it to him. But um, yeah, and I think not only in terms of sexualization, but also ideology. So that's another reason why the fear of um, the communist infiltration that because the teacher has so much power, they can influence the child. I appreciate that question so much because I think it does bring us to the contemporary, right? That if you just even put the word teachers into the New York Times search, you will get article after article about a teacher being fired or being disciplined yeah. um, for teaching about gender and sexuality, for teaching about race, mm -hmm. um, or even just still like being morally unfit, mm -hmm. that teachers can still be dismissed from this in certain cases and institutions. And so it seemed to me that your book is also quite timely that it reflects on a history that we are still living in the reverberations of. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, to hold this beautiful book in your hand now and see, okay, here we are now in November of 2023. There are certain things that probably you could not have predicted while writing the book. Right. Is there anything that has struck you particularly about where we are now? I'm, I'm upset. I mean, I think that it's uh, very difficult to be a teacher at this time. I mean, um, teachers are um, quite literally under attack when we um, see that the nation is doing nothing about these continued mass shootings. Uh, and then also um, teachers are being attacked because um, they're foisting um, books on children that deal with um, sexuality that they, uh, parents um, don't think that they should be reading. Um, but as I said, also, I'm also very concerned about the, um, political time period. And um, I, I think that if um, the presidency changes uh, next year, uh, one of the first places that we'll see it affecting is education. I mean, we are already seeing what DeSantis is doing in Florida, for instance, with New College. So um, Sorry to end it on this downer note. <laughs> but, but sorry, but I want to take it's that. It's from Matilda. <laughs> but to take that to the up note, the fact that you have found, you know, so much uh, richness in this material from history that really does make us reflect on our society. Yeah. And to me, that book does make a statement and it's a powerful statement. And that to me is a beautiful thing to celebrate. Right. Thank you, Jordan. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
So thank you, and I hope you can all stay for a little celebration. We have a, some drinks and some libations and uh, something to eat. So again, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Jordan. Thank you.